Hi, I'm Nigel Redman. In my last video, I covered how Dither works. In this one, I'll tell you when to use it, and I'll tell you why. For practical reasons, we usually consider only 16 bits or 24 bits these days, so here is my general advice. When reducing to 16 bits, always dither. Often, it's not necessary to dither because enough noise already exists in the recording to self-dither. But if that's the case, the added dither noise is less than what's already there. And if it isn't, you probably need the dither noise. So this is a no-brainer. Always dither to 16 bits. When reducing to 24 bits, don't dither. But if you feel you must, go ahead. You won't hear the added noise anyway, just as you won't hear the truncation noise if you don't. Now, I know that some people are clutching their foreheads and asking, why, oh why, didn't he just say, always dither and be on the safe side, and give us one simple rule. First, suggesting to always dither doesn't answer the question, which is, do we need to dither 24 bits? And we don't. Second, while dithering to 24 bits for a final product adds no significant effort or processing cost, such an answer would imply that we should also dither to 24 bits for effect sends outside the box and any other place truncations occur, including inside plugins. This is significantly more effort and is unnecessary and useless. Some believe that we should always dither, but I think that many come to this conclusion by listening to truncation distortion at a very small sample size where it is heard easily and extrapolating the results. For instance, a person might reduce the sample size of a song to 8 bits, hear awful truncation distortion, and assume that at 16 bits, the distortion would be the same except 48 dB quieter. But this is a bad assumption. Truncation distortion is level dependent. I'll demonstrate a technique to show why the irritating distortion for 8 bits may not exist at all at 16 bits. The best way to hear truncation distortion is to remove the original audio leaving only the truncation error, pure distortion. We'll truncate a song, then subtract out the original song. With the signal removed, we can compare the quality of distortion at various bit levels by compensating the output gain without the music getting in the way. This way, we can compare 8-bit truncation with 16-bit truncation or any other sample sizes at the same listening volume. We could use common plugins along with mixer busing on multiple channels to do this test, but it's cumbersome and error prone to switch between sample sizes and proper gain compensation, so I created a plugin. Here's the block diagram. To start, we take our high resolution signal and quantize to any bit depth we'd like. We can listen to the result, or we can subtract the original signal from it and monitor only the truncation error. Next, we include a calculated gain to normalize the levels so that we can listen to 8-bit truncation error at the same volume as 16-bit or 24-bit. Finally, we'd like to compare this with the same sample sizes dithered. We simply inject TPDF noise at the appropriate bit level before truncating. I chose this source material somewhat arbitrarily. I happen to have a 32-bit floating point test mix, just a scratch recording of an idea that I wanted to save for further development. It has some desirable qualities, only 40 seconds, it has a nice reverb tail and fade out, and no drums or cymbals to create a wash of noise, just sampled strings, sampled piano, vocal, and reverb. Let's listen to the opening few seconds. As the Okay, I'd like to first zoom into a really rough 8-bit version. As the last now to make the change more apparent, I'll take the difference. Take this 8-bit truncation, subtract the original high-resolution recording, and listen to just the error introduced by the truncation. We're left with low-level hiss. I'll use the normalization feature of my plugin to bring the output level up to a constant minus 30 dB. That requires a 24 dB boost in gain. Now it's much easier to hear, and it sounds like white noise. In fact, there's no difference adding dither, which makes all error white essentially, 
This indicates the dither gives no improvement here, and this continues for almost the entire recording. But we'll see that there is a difference in the end, in the fade. And that's the characteristic tearing sound that we get on fadeouts due to truncation. Here's what the fade sounds like at 8 bits. You can hear the distortion just as the strings lift. Now let's hear what dither buys us. With dither, we have a much higher noise level, but it has totally fixed the tearing sound. Recognize that the dither noise is not masking it, but randomizing it, changing it to a white noise spectrum. Let's go back and listen to that error at different bit levels. Again, here's our 8 bit. And again, that's boosted 24 dB. Now let's listen to it at 10 bit. That sounds much worse, and you might think, why did it get worse at a higher resolution? The distortion is longer in duration as more of the reverb tail remains at the LSB threshold. But remember also that we've boosted the volume by another 12 dB to maintain the constant minus 30 dB normalization. Let's try it at 12 bit. Even worse, but again, now we're at 48 dB. This would be getting hard to hear without the large gain factor. Let's continue and try 12 bit, 13 bit. Clearly this is bad, 14 bit. At 14 bit we're pretty much at white noise, just the slightest of tonal changes, and we're right at the edge of not needing dither whatsoever. And in fact, at a 60 dB gain now for normalization, you'd be hard pressed to hear any additional distortion. At 15 bit, 16 bit, and up, it's clear that this particular piece of music doesn't require dither. And again, we're boosting the level 72 dB here. So, with it apparent that this bit of music doesn't need dither at 16 bits, does that change my recommendation to always dither 16 bits? No. The reason we don't need dither here is because there's already enough noise inherent in the recording process to self-dither. With that level already much greater than the amount of dither noise we'd be adding, you wouldn't even hear the additional dither noise. At 24 bits, you can see that the normalization to minus 30 dB requires 120 dB of gain. Besides the fact that real recordings already have many times the noise needed to self-dither, you can't hear the LSB of a 24-bit recording. Your converters can't reproduce it with any accuracy, and it's drowned in the thermal noise of your electronic components. Finally, let's think about why even the 8-bit truncation didn't need dither until the final fade. I believe it's due to signal complexity, piano, strings, voice, reverb, creating ample chaos in the signal level and making the truncation distortion audibly random. But this was a rough recording. How do professional mixes stand up to truncation? I plan to give you some real-world examples, coming soon.